Welcome to the Fix Your Sciatica podcast, where we meet with experts and clients and discuss how to manage your sciatica and low back pain without the use of medications or surgery. I'm your host, Dr. Ashley Mack, and I'm a physical therapist as well as the founder of iFixYourSciatica.com, a go-to resource for pain management. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you for listening. And if you are tuning in again, welcome back. And lastly, if you find today's episode or any of these episodes of this podcast to be helpful or insightful, please follow and rate this podcast on whatever platform you're using. The more followers and ratings we get, the more we can help people like you. And without further ado, let's get started. I started training in martial arts when I was a little kid starting off with Taekwondo. And it taught me a lot about myself and a lot of really important life lessons. As I've evolved and grown up as an adult, I took a break from martial arts. But in 2019, I had the opportunity to actually start training in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And it was something that really opened up my mind to the possibilities of what the human body and the human mind could do. And it is an ever evolving art form. And being that jujitsu is very physical, there are a possible, uh, a lot of possible injuries that could happen, but with any sort of physical activity, there's always going to be some sort of risk. And so in today's episode, I actually have a physical therapist and jujitsu practitioner who can actually tie together recovery, rehab, and how to tie it in to the art of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and other martial arts in general. So in today's episode, I have Dr. Eugene Sozik, who is a BJJ black belt, a doctor of physical therapy for over 10 years, a functional range conditioning movement specialist who specializes in orthopedic rehab, return to sport, and injury mitigation for BJJ and Grappling RX Rehab Series for BJJ, and also the co-host of the Jiu-Jitsu podcast. Eugene, thank you so much for being on today's episode. Thanks for having me on. So a lot of people who are listening to this podcast are either new to the Jiu-Jitsu space or just trying to figure out how to actually manage the pain that they're going through, specifically sciatica, um, and how to get back into activities they love. So we'll talk about Jiu-Jitsu itself. But before we take a deep dive into that, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what your journey has been like to get to this point today? Um, so a, a lot of uh, aspects. So we'll start from the very beginning. I did a little Taekwondo uh, at six years old, actually. And, uh, you know, my parents, I actually was born in Russia and came to the States when I was six years old and um, you know, don't have a lot of money or anything like that, you know, being an immigrant and um So my parents decided to put me in Taekwondo, but it was like short lived because they would never let me belt test and every every belt test cost money, right? And we didn't have money. So I would just do the same white belt katas or whatever. I don't know what you call them anymore, but the same stuff over and over every time. And I kind of got tired of it. So I kind of, you know, we quit because they're like the, the, the instructor was like, oh, belt test, belt test. It's money. We didn't have money. So, you know, that, that was, uh, that was short lived my martial arts journey, but my interest in, um, you know, I was always, uh, playing sports, soccer, primarily, you know, it was, it was a big thing for me. Um, but I was just always interested in sports and things like that. That's kind of where the interest in physical therapy came in, just looking at what I wanted to do for a career. Um, but jujitsu was interesting in, in the fact that, uh, some people may not know what VHS tapes are, but I was about, I don't know, eight to 10 years old, somewhere around there. And it was UFC six and being Russian, you know, you saw my dad went to Blockbuster and found the UFC six. It had Oleg Taktarov, who is the Russian bear, I'm like, oh, cool. And, and we just started watching. I was so infatuated by like just the UFC. And I was like, oh, I thought it was the coolest thing, the excitement of it. And then you go back back and start watching the other ones and you have hoist gracie and he wins all the ufc's this skinny scrawny guy that in a in a kimono that's just like choking people like this is amazing like he looked untouchable and it was just you know even him going against ken shamrock and one of the first the first ufc and ken shamrock is this jacked just muscular guy and you're like oh this is going to be this is going to be a demolishing and, and hoist just choked him out and it was so it was so cool um so that was my first interest in um the ufc and kind of jujitsu and so um, as far as going to physical therapy school, um, I was always kind of interested in, 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 like I said, athletic sports, 
just being active with my body. I never thought I'd want to sit in a, you know, like a nine to five and just type on a computer all day. Although some physical therapy is getting that way. Um, <laughs> but um, actually, my brother tore his ACL. Uh, I was in my early 20s when he did that. And I just started going to physical therapy with him just to watch what they were doing. I just got really infatuated with what they did and the recovery process. And that's kind of where my, my interest in, in physical therapy started to flourish as well. Wow. So uh, what a cool journey um, ev uh, evolving from like what you've seen and identifying like, yeah, this is really cool. Let me go ahead and pursue mm -hmm. that. And yeah, yeah. that is like a very similar uh, trajectory for me throughout my career was any cool opportunity that seemed appealing and exciting to me. I said, okay, let me go ahead and pursue that. Um, so I, I love that the fact that we are sharing that same type of deal. Um, all right. So let's get into the meat and potatoes. So let's talk about sciatica. Now sciatica affects all of us. It's not just limited to people outside the jujitsu world. And so if we're looking at the jujitsu world specifically, um, how would someone who practices BJJ experience episodes of sciatica pain in, in your, and from what you've seen? Um, it really depends, you know, what the cause is like, where, where is the, and this might be something, you know, since you specialize and you might be able to better elaborate on, um, you know, jujitsu is more of a flexion sport, I would say, right. We're rounded, we're closed in. A lot of times we're getting, we're inverting, which is me. If somebody doesn't know what that is kind of like, almost like rolling up onto your, your shoulders your your mid back, your shoulders and your neck. Um, sometimes you get stacked, meaning somebody's bringing kind of like your knees towards your chest forcefully, um, causing that flexion, that bending in the spine. And that can cause some issues with the discs. You know, you see a lot of disc herniations and bulges and things like that, which aren't uncommon in everyday life. Anyway, somebody can have that just sitting at a, at a desk all day. Um, but the compression, the flexion and all that stuff, like the pulling in and closing, I think that can be something that uh, can can definitely can definitely uh, provoke some of the sciatica stuff uh, or the low back pain and then the ridiculous symptoms of the pain down the down the legs. Now the cause of the sciatica, I mean, I think that's kind of a broad term, and and there could be different causes. Maybe you know, in your expertise, you can kind of elaborate and tell people like what are some potential causes, and you know, we can kind of discuss that as well. But I would say the like the flexion and like the compression is is probably one of the, the the, the things that can really lead to that jujitsu um, related uh, pain and, and specifically injury. And I think that as a jujitsu practitioner, you're a fairly new one. Jujitsu infatuates you. It, it, it interests you. It kind of consumes you in a lot of ways. And that's all you ever want to do. And that's a problem as well for people where they kind of overload their body. They don't allow, allow their body to adapt or they feed into a certain pattern. And then, you're just kind of asking for trouble because, you know, with jujitsu, we want to, longevity is very important and uh, longevity requires, you know, maintenance of the body, um, care of the body and, and, and kind of uh, corrective exercise can be a thing. Um, and the other point I'll make is that an error. And I think a lot of the physical therapy realm in our education is we don't use physical therapy as like a maintenance type uh, of approach. Like, we don't address problems before they occur. And so we're usually like trying to catch up, like somebody already has an issue and we're trying to heal that or fix that issue for them or help them uh, treat that issue. And the problem is if we can catch it before it happens or prevent it, it's such an easier process. Yeah. Prevention is probably the best treatment. I actually just gave a seminar on sciatic and low back pain to a cross gym and we were talking about treatments like self-treatments for sciatic and low back pain. And I laugh about this because I just think it's the most ridiculous statement, but they say like the best treatment for sciatica is prevention. And it really bothers me because it's like, well, you're in pain right now. Of course, you don't want to be in this in the first place. And so it, it's really, it's not a very productive statement, but I'm right there with you in regards to prevention is really important. Um, and that, yeah, with a lot of the movements, in jujitsu with a lot of that flexion, it could place a fair amount of stress on the disc. And I remember when I was uh, just being a physical therapist and looking at the jujitsu world and seeing these athletes um, get stacked, get flexed, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, 
how can their body tolerate such a thing? And and the, and the reason I had that question was because of the fact that the first five years of my physical therapy education, just like many other people, the concept of forward bending at the spine was a very bad thing, right? It was so demonized. It was like, you bend forward, touch your toes. No, you're going to herniate your disc and you're going to be d- damaged forever. And in a way that kind of created this fear avoidance standpoint in which I noticed, uh, and especially early in my career, that I would tell people, you are never allowed to bend your low back. And it creates this fear and this anxiety that people have, especially when they're bending forward. But then as I transitioned into starting jujitsu myself, I actually noticed that as I was assuming these positions, now granted that the number of years I've been practicing jujitsu is very limited, but it was exciting to see, oh, well, if I flex forward or get stacked in a way, doesn't really kill me. Uh, which is a very exciting thing. But I've noticed and I've identified that sciatica is actually caught or most injuries are actually caused by two major uh, scenarios, um, trauma and an overuse. And it's interesting because I look at when I work with my patients, I look at the entire lifespan, the activities that they do, plus the lifestyle that they live. And so if they get hurt in say jujitsu or sport that they do, um, or it's not, and the big question is, was the sport that they were doing actually the cause of the pain? Or could it have been the other 23 hours of the day that they're actually spent sitting down or laying on the couch in a hunch forward position? So we start playing this detective and try to figure out, okay, what, what, what was it? Was it a true trauma? Was it somewhere where the, our athletes were significantly flexed? They were like stacked uh, during a pass? Or was it the fact that they've been sitting for six hours because they were driving from one place to the other? And as we ask those questions as clinicians, we can then start to identify, all right, what can we do to address these issues? We are going to take a quick break to tell you about our awesome new program called the Sciatica Protocol. If you don't have the time to see a professional, but are tired of trying to figure out this recovery on your own, then the sciatica protocol is for you. Harness the power of a knowledgeable physical therapist through your phone. It takes no more than seven minutes per day, and it is designed to help you recover as quickly as possible. Now, having an on-demand physical therapist can cost thousands plus hours of sessions. But with the sciatica protocol, you'll receive the same, if not better, customized care completely free. And why are we making this program free? Because I believe that everyone deserves to live free from pain without actually having cost be the biggest obstacle. It is simple to start and all you need to do is log into ifixyoursciatica.com forward slash the dash sciatica dash protocol and fill out the nine question quiz to begin. The link for the program is in today's show notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mitigation and, and like trying to, um, you know, with jujitsu, it's important that it, you have proper mobility and you're able to move into flexion and you're able to move in these other multiplanar movements, because if you can't, somebody's going to put you there. And if your body doesn't like it or hasn't, isn't used to being in those positions, that's when you get hurt. Right. That that's where, that's where injuries occur. So if like, if you tell people, yeah, I mean, you shouldn't, like this, and this is kind of uh, some differing opinions, but like if you're deadlifting, you know, you have to have a good hip hinge, nice straight spine, best you can. However, like you should still be able to, like, that's not, that's lifting heavy, heavy weight, but if you should still be able to round and have mo- mobility at each segment of your spine, whether it's flexion and extension bending or, or, you know, extending back. And if you don't have that, like, and somebody forces you there on, in jujitsu or you have a traumatic, you know, you fall or what, whatever. Like, and somebody forces you there, you get forced in that position, your body doesn't have that capacity to move, you're going to be in deep trouble. Like you, that's when you get injured, right? You're going past the the movement capabilities that you have. And that's, that's a problem. And so you have to, um, I, I think one of my favorite quotes, I, the continuing education course, that was one of my favorites was like the functional range conditioning, um, Dr. Andre Spina, and it's basically like, cars or controlled articular articular rotations, joint circles and things like that, end range strengthening. And the the quote for me that stands out that he shared was you can't move where you can't move. So that that's a problem. You know, if you can't move somewhere and somebody puts you there, uh, you know, that's where, that's where issues can occur. And um, so 
joint mobility maintenance is, is really vital, really important uh, off the jiu-jitsu mats as well. Yeah, which then leads us into the concept of uh, physical readiness. Like if you're going to be taking on activity, you have to make sure that you are physically ready and also mentally ready as well. And one of the things that I really, I mean, one of the many things that I love about jujitsu is the fact that when you are training and you're practicing, there's nothing else that exists in the world other than you and your partner or other than you on the mat. And so I find that jujitsu in itself for me puts me even more in tune with my body which allows me to really identify what my limitations are. And so being yeah. able to, and so that, that in itself is, is really amazing. Yeah. It's vital. It's vital for you to be, especially if, if as a new practitioner, you're present with what's going on um, just to keep yourself safe and your partner safe. Cause if, if you're kind of distracted uh, and, and I, I've been doing jitsu for, you know, since 2008. So I, I get kind of, I think I talk about like that, a flow state you just kind of react you just move like you know i just kind of move if usually it's somebody that's like a uh a newer practitioner you're moving with them you're guiding them mm-hmm. you're kind of taking them where you want to take them uh and it, it's not as a mentally um daunting process but like when you're when you're newer on the mats you got to really pay attention for your placement of your extremities and your and your body and how you're positioning yourself right on so let's talk about people who are experiencing injuries right now. They're practicing jujitsu and they're like, man, yeah, I, 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 I'm experiencing this thing going down my leg. It could be sciatica. The internet has been telling me sciatica. And this could actually be applied to anyone who has injuries in general. But if someone, like if, if, a, if a jujitsu practitioner is injured, what are, what are some, uh, well, I guess my question is like, in your opinion, if they're injured, can they train around that injury? Um, so then that way they can stay active and, and within their best ability. And it's, it's a big, uh, it depends, you know, it depends on, um, it's hard when you're not someone with a medical background to really know the severity of your injury. And sometimes people will just see if they quote unquote rest or if they just, uh, if it goes away or they'll train through it. I don't think it's a good idea to train through something and more maybe train train around, see if you can manage. Um, and a lot of that would be, can you modify techniques? Can you modify positions? Can, maybe you drill and don't go live rolling, maybe do positional rolling. Um, so it just depends on the, on the injury, but yes, I, I, with jujitsu practitioners, they will do everything in their power to stay on the mats. Um, I'm the same way. I've injured myself. I've, I've fractured arms. You know, I've had injuries. I still train and I train in some capacity. And I think you can, again, it just depends on the severity of your injury. Now, if you, um, if you, if training makes your pain worse, if you go in, you train and, and you modify and you, it doesn't increase your pain, you feel safe on the mats and nothing, that's probably okay. But if, if, you go in, you train, maybe you do very light or you modify, and you do everything you can to modify and your symptoms are still getting worse. And I think it's, a, that's, that's when you kind of have to shut it down for a little while. And that doesn't mean don't do anything. It doesn't mean go sit on your couch and quote unquote rest. Cause that's the advice we used to give people or doctors used to give people. Um, but movement is very important. You, you do what you can and you try to work around it the best you can. I a hundred percent agree with that. Um, resting itself i think it the the term oh you should just rest and i remember early on in my days i would have i would be working with patients who would have um i had this one client who actually had a four hour commute door to door and that was just one way and they had a four hour commute door to door which means that they spent eight hours a day traveling plus an eight hours a day sitting at their office desk and then they're having some back pain and what was interesting was the doctor said, oh, yeah, you got to rest. You can't ex- you cannot exercise. Mm-hmm. And I just <laughs> didn't make any sense because 24 hours a day, they're sedentary. And it really just it, it didn't it didn't add up to me in, in regards to the, the rest concept. And so um, being able to train around injuries is a very crucial thing because there's a lot of benefits to moving and exercising in the presence of pain. Even with getting our heart rates up, getting our joints moving, there's going to be anti-inflammatory hormones that cycle through our bodies, which will actually help with managing the pain. I wouldn't say fix the pain, but it can downregulate 
calm it down a little bit so you can function. And plus, there's a lot of psychological benefits to exercise. And when you are in fact in pain for a long period of time, most of the time, that is also going to be taxing on the emotional, psychological aspects that come along with chronic injuries. So being able to train around it is, is really big. And um, a big lesson that I learned in jujitsu was the concept of you don't necessarily have to force one way, um, which I found to be so amazing. You don't have to muscle through. And if you can find the path of least resistance or the path of the easiest thing to get done, um, go for it rather than trying to put yourself in at risk and at these interesting positions where you can, in fact, put yourself more at risk of getting hurt. So those are really great strategies, Eugene. Thank you for so much for sharing with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, people who are new are to this podcast or new to jujitsu or haven't even heard about what jujitsu is, um, they're probably thinking, okay, well, if I hear jujitsu, I think about what I see in the UFC, um, some really hard hitting people. Um, and it's scary. And because of that, a lot of medical practitioners aren't familiar with the demands and what is what can be expected uh, as a jujitsu practitioner. So for those naysayers, those medical practitioners to say, you should never train this modality, this art. Um, what's your response to, to, to a statement like that? That's a tough one. And I've heard, um, I've heard this before, and I think it's changing somewhat, you, you know, you, the, the question you get more is like, why would you do this? Like, why, why are you putting yourself in this position or these risks? Or it's like, until you train until someone that understands what training jujitsu is and what the, the, the art is, um, they're not going to understand that. Like, so I think as a practitioner, or, or as a medical provider, it's important that you try to support your, your patients. And what you need to do is educate yourself. You, you, you know, you're, you're going to, if you're going to tell a jujitsu practitioner, you need to stop doing jujitsu. They're going to find somebody else, or they're going to do something that they're, they're basically going to just not listen to you. Cause it's, this is something, unless it's like a life threatening thing, like, Hey, uh, if somebody, you know, you maybe have a head, in, whatever, like there are some instances, like even and there are risks in jujitsu, like, uh, you know, people have gotten strokes from getting choked, you know, you get trauma to the arteries and then you have a clot and the clot gets, and we actually had a guy on our podcast that had a stroke, uh, from a choke. Um, it's, it's, it's scary and it can happen, but you know, if you're mindful and you're, um, you know, you're educated in kind of some of the things you, you it can be mitigated to an extent, right? But it's always a risk. I mean, you could walk across the street and hit by a car. It's always a risk, right? I'm getting on, on tangent here, but honestly, like uh, the the when so, when a when a doctor or somebody else tells their their patient not to train jujitsu, it's just lack of education. Um, and I think you have to educate yourself. So if you're a practitioner, uh, you know, a, a a a health provider, I mean, you need to go. I mean, I've had physical therapists reach out to me and say, Hey, I've got so-and-so, uh, they have a knee problem. I'm not familiar with jujitsu. What can you tell me? What kind of guidance can you give me? Um, so you have to kind of be, you know, proactive in that capacity. And if you're a patient, you have to educate, you have to say, Hey, here's a YouTube video. Here's a, this, here's that. Give them some information some visual because some physical therapists many of them can figure out like if you go in and say hey i have my knee hurts you know i have knee issues or i have an acl tear but i want to get back to doing this some therapists don't know what this is so educate them show them some basics because they can kind of back engineer and figure out a little bit on the what capacity or what needs are required not not specifically but they can they can figure it out. I was actually a, a fun story. I was actually with an orthopedic surgeon and they've been seeing a lot of meniscus tears uh, from jujitsu, you know, from some, from some uh, jujitsu athletes. And they're like, yeah, they, the, the doctor's like, they, he said he got injured from a lockdown. What's a lockdown. I was like, let me show you. So I got on YouTube and I showed him what a lockdown is 
and how it impacts the knee, right? It's uh, what it does and how it affects the knee and how it can injure the knee. It's a traction and a rotation kind of injury for the meniscus. So like, like, oh, okay, I get it. I see what the mechanism of it, uh, of the injury is. So I think it's it's education on both ends. As a patient, you have to educate or try to promote some education for your uh, medical provider. As a medical provider, you have to be proactive because jujitsu is getting a lot more popular and you're going to see a lot more of these injuries. Whether they're traumatic, whether they're overuse, you're going to see them. And you have to figure out a way to get these people to train safely, get them back on the mats. Otherwise, they're just going to say, forget your advice. I'm just going to go back and do it myself. And that's dangerous. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Trying, and I don't, I don't know if you've experienced, but I know for me, I'm also one of the worst patients because if I ever hurt myself, I'm like, oh, I think I'm going to be okay. And then kind of mm -hmm. go through it. And then I regret it later, later down the road. But, um, one of the big things Dude, all the time, man, <laughs> all the, all the damn time, unfortunately. And so I think it is important that, um, and you broke it down that response down perfectly where you're having a conversation to the healthcare practitioner and then to the patient uh, themselves. And I think it's also important as, as a practitioner that yes, we should for sure educate ourselves. Um, and then also for the patient to be able to share if they're not familiar with whatever sport you're doing to show them some examples. And I don't know if you do this, but this is what I do when I'm out in the street, I actually look at every human body and I put them like, um, I put like a, a grid behind them to see just overall, like I start to start studying how they move. And it's just something, it's a normal occurrence for me um, yeah. now. But one thing that I think is really underrated that is a very powerful tool for practitioners is that if they don't know uh, enough and they don't feel confident in their skills, rather than trying to create some sort of conclusion because they didn't want to lose that yeah. patient as a client, um, is to be able to refer out, be able to refer out to professionals great point. or other professionals, and just and and not to say that you are not a competent therapist or practitioner because you're not specific on this one art or modality, but being able to recognize your limitations. And ultimately, we're in the business, you, my, you and myself and healthcare practitioners to take care of our patients. And so we need to provide the best opportunities for them to recover. And if it's not with you, that's okay. And being able to give therapists, practitioners permission to say, I think you need to speak with so-and-so, which would then me mean expanding your network. Um, Listeners, I had the chance to reach out to Eugene because I knew that as a young jujitsu practitioner, I've only been doing it for three years. There's still a lot that I need to learn. And seeing the growth and the number of people who practice jujitsu, I said, well, how can I get linked up with someone who knows a lot more about that than I do, but then also apply it in the physical therapy standpoint. And I came across Eugene and this podcast, and I'm so glad that I did. <laughs> Yeah, appreciate that. And, and I think that just sets aside, like, I mean, everybody always, um, my, my jiu-jitsu coach, Chewy, we talk about ego a lot. And ego being, uh, we all ha have an ego and uh, um, a healthy ego is important. Now, ego can go many different ways, uh, but like having a, an ego, like the, the ego that we talk about is like, hey, it's to Number one is like ego tells me to put food in my mouth first before I, you know, it's, you got to take care of yourself. Um, but also like you have to have a balance in your ego to like, Hey, somebody has a better knowledge of me. Like for you, you probably have a better knowledge of treating sciatica specifically like sciatica is like your realm. So like, if you're like, Hey, how am I going to treat that? Or I'd love to learn like what your perspectives are on that. You've been practicing, you know, as a therapist for a while, I want to know what you would do. Like if I would do something different, so I would, you know, refer to you for that. Cause this is your wheelhouse, right? Like, um, it, th that to me just shows someone that's kind of, that knows what they know and know what they don't know. You know, th there's therapists that are, that are better at certain things than I am. Like I may not be the best neurotherapist. I may not be the best therapist to treat your stroke. Right. I think I can do a pretty decent job, but there's people that specialize in stroke rehab and they might be better than I am. Um, but like referring or right, or, or being able to even reach out and say, I think I can handle this, but let me educate myself first. Let me spend some time outside of, of 
the work environment and actually educate myself and learn and then reach out to people and ask questions like, man, like we, we have this powerful network of, of education is getting better and like our knowledge is getting better. The research is more and more research. We're learning so much. And I think um, there's a lot out there and just being able to reach out to people and say, hey, can you lead me in the right direction or give me some some point or some advice? I mean, I think it's just it's just uh, it's very valuable and it shows a, a good, healthy ego. And I think that's important because we come out of therapy thinking or, or physical therapy school thinking that we're going to treat and heal the world. And we realize, man, that's a lot harder. It's a lot harder. We have these big aspirations. We realize, all right, we got to pick and choose our battles and focus on things that maybe interest us and also where we can make the most impact. And that's hard because if you try to be everywhere, you're going to be nowhere and you're not going to make, you're not going to make the impact that you want. Right on making an impact, focusing on what you can do, focusing on what you can do. So yeah, yeah awesome. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with, with us. So let's go back into talking about um, sciatica pain and, and BJJ. Let's let's talk about some some strategies uh, in regards to like cases that you've seen uh, and how and, and the best strategies that you found to be effective. And then I'll share that too. Well, I think that uh, I I would like I would say for you to lead like as far as like where I would probably shine in this area is is changing up uh, more like training specific modifications. So let me ask you this, like, uh, we'll kind of turn the tables a little bit. Um, is if you see somebody that comes in with sciatic issues, or, you know, demonstrate or present as a site, what, what is your kind of strategy initially? Um, what do you do? Like, maybe as, as far as your assessment goes, what do you do first? And then kind of what advice do you give them? And maybe even what do you, when they do go back, I'll take over. Like when this, you're sending them back to jujitsu, right? You say, all right, you can go back and start training. I'll take over that part. So you see somebody that just gets injured presents like that. What's your kind of thought process? Yeah. <clears throat> so my thought process, my first priority is to reduce pain. Um, and so um, I will go through the standard physical therapy evaluation, which is going to take a look at range of motion and strength, but really what range of motion and strength is going to be is really more so setting a baseline to identify, okay, is the stretch exercise modality I'm providing actually improve range of motion, reduce their pain and improve their strength. And when it comes to sciatica issues, I'm a huge fan of actually starting as centrally as possible. So I'll actually focus specifically on the back first. And so this, like the first two to three sessions, because I usually work with people once maybe twice a week, depending on what their schedule allows them to do. And usually it's during that first session where we implement some sort of spinal motion, whether it be up and standing. So when you're in standing, you can either bend forward, touch your toes, do a back bend like you're doing a, a limbo, um, slide your hand down your thigh like you're doing a side bend. Um, and then rotation, which I find people a lot of times overlook the power, power of rotation on improving sciatic issues, especially in the spine. And then from there, if standing doesn't help, then I actually move into laying on your back, laying on your side, changing the position and also implementing that because gravity itself will have a huge impact in regards to how the body feels, how the body responds. For sure. For sure. And then and once I've exhausted all back stuff, then I move down to the hip, down to every other aspect. And then throughout that time, if I ever... And again, the big focus is reducing the pain, improving range of motion, and increasing strength. So whatever modality, I'm always referencing those baselines to be able to see, did we change those baselines? And usually when I work with people, I only give people maybe between a maximum of five stretches or five different things to do, because mm -hmm. the reality is, is that we're all really busy humans and the 45 minutes to an hour that we do work together only accounts for 4% of the day and even smaller percentage of the week. And so from there, once I can find, uh, I call them symptom mitigators. If it's something that actually makes you feel better, that's going to be your stretch of the day. But then also trying to figure out what is happening throughout the day in your training that could actually be contributing to, to that as well. So I actually encourage all my patients to actually keep a pain journal, which actually helps us identify, okay, um, is it the time of day scenario that's actually causing their pain to increase? Or is it the fact that 
at this time of day, they're sitting for three to four hours and do we need to change their behaviors? And so once we bring that pain down by focusing on everything that we do to address that pain, we can then transition into adding like the other stretches that could be useful in prevention. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, once they're, once they're better, I tell them, uh, my goal is to get it so that you fire me for my job because you don't need me anymore. And then they go to people like you, Eugene, who can get back into the mat safely and, and back into training. Yeah, I, I agree. Like you, um, I do the same, you know, assessment, do the general assessment. You're watching, you know, single leg stance, you're having them flex forward, extend back, rotate, um, checking some gentle strength that you're checking the neuro neural tension. You're doing that stuff, seeing if, all right, um, being prone or being on your belly on elbows, does that help or does that make it worse? Right? So sometimes it, it helps if it's maybe a, a disc issue and being in, in that extended position, like the McKenzie exercises, those can be helpful. And a lot of times it's helpful in jujitsu because we're so flexed all the time. So getting into that opposite position just can be good. It's good for just balance, just to be in that position a little bit. Um, and, and then you got to like, you know, you have your magnifying glass on the low back and now you start to extrapolate, you go out, right? You zoom out. Let's look at the thoracic spine. Let's look at the hips, right? Are you hip stiff? Is there anything that's that you're, you're lacking movement? You know, a lot of times, not always. And people think, you know, oh, like hip flexors are going to be tight. Well, not always, but but they can be. It's common because people sit a lot and in jujitsu we pull our knees in, keep everything tight. So yeah, those those muscles tend to be fairly strong. But what are the opposing muscles doing? Right? Is it maybe just increased tone because your glutes are not as strong? It just depends, right? So there's a lot of variability there. You know, where's the the issue with with the nerve? Right? The sciatic nerve is is it something in the hip glute area is it something low back where are your symptoms what's what's the origin of your symptoms and going to a physical therapist um, getting that thorough evaluation and figuring out what the origin of your of your symptoms are you know well if you maybe say you get on on your belly and prop up on your elbows and that releases that relieves some of that tension or that pain down your leg okay all right. Well, that's something. Okay. Well, let's see what your body likes. Let's get in that position a little more and get that pain to calm down. And then we're going to start getting into, eventually we're going to move you into the positions that your body maybe doesn't like, we're going to do it very gradually and build some confidence. Right. And we want to separate those movement patterns from pain, right? We want those movement patterns to be pain-free. And so we're going to gently move you in there, you know, and that that's kind of the way we work. But as far as going to back into jujitsu, I'm going to try to keep you out of the positions that increase your pain initially, like, or I'm going to make sure that you're in those positions without any kind of uh, variables are going to increase your chance of re-injury. Um, as you know, this is a, probably a very, very uh, common quote, the, the predictor, uh, what the number one predictor of injury is previous injury. And so I don't want you, if you got injured by getting stacked, your knees got pulled into your chest. Somebody's on top of you, stacked you or something like that. Well, I don't want to put you in that position if I don't. So I may have you do more uh, jujitsu positions from top position where you don't feel like you're going to get stacked. Or you may not do closed guard. You may do side, like a, like a half guard or something like that, where maybe you're not as likely to get compressed. And that's kind of where I'll do. And I'll, and I'll basically, I take out the variables first. Less variables, meaning you're just drilling. Then you do partner drilling, then you do positional rolling, then you add the full on rolling, right? Stand up, all that stuff. So you take out the variables and gradually build that in. That's kind of the way you're going to approach it. You're just going to, you're going to really just be build confidence, right? You, you want to build that mind body connection. And uh, because after you've been injured, people think, oh, I don't have any pain. I'm good to go. I'm healed. Not, nope. That's not true. Just because you don't have pain does not mean you're healed. That doesn't mean your your muscles are are uh, firing, uh, you know, as as properly as they should. Meaning, your brain's going to tell you do this movement, do this movement, but there's going to be a delay because you're you're just out of rhythm and you're out of sequence. So it's just uh, it takes time to build that back and build that confidence back and the pain free patterns and all that stuff. So it's uh, you know that that, that those are kind of some of the, the, the key ideas. Well, the, I love the fact that you brought up the concept of taking out all the variables, but then slowly reintroducing them. I think modern day physical therapy, a lot of people who've gone through modern day physical therapy can 
and especially when they've had not the greatest experience in rehab, that they felt like either there were too many variables added all at once in regards to, oh, okay, you have sciatica pain. Okay, I was just given 15 different exercises from my physical therapist. I don't know if any of them actually help. Yeah. As com- and so you have that on one end of the spectrum, and then you have the one who actually doesn't implement variables. So I've worked with a lot of people who, and I'm usually their second or third therapist after like to treat these conditions because of the fact that their therapist wasn't able to progress them. It wasn't, wasn't able to truly challenge them, make it specific to whatever, whatever needs, whatever physical demands that they had. Yeah. So then when they come to me, they're 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 skeptical as they should because they've used two to three other therapists before me and they're thinking is this what the experience is going to be like moving forward is this what the profession has to offer and so to hear another like-minded person who says this is our process this is how we're going to start challenging and even yes being able to say does your body like this position let's do more of it that is something that's still rel- like a relatively new concept because every the majority of the clients that I've worked with, they're like, yeah, no one's ever asked me that. And so it's really amazing to hear you share that. And uh, a quick little aside for you listeners, uh, Eugene talked about these McKenzie based exercises. And um, if you aren't, if so, generally speaking, McKenzie based exercises are mostly extension based. So you're looking at like press ups, back bends. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the story about these these exercises came about because prior to the McKenzie exercises, which Robin McKenzie, who was, uh, he, he passed away, I think probably, what, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, he is an Australian, was an Australian physio. And prior to him coming up with this technique, everyone who had back issues would go through this, it's called the Williams flexion exercises. So that's where you're looking at pelvic tilts, knees to chest, forward bends. You had all those exercises. And what was interesting was that one day, Robin McKenzie had a patient who was, I don't know what body part he was using, but the table was uh, inclined. So it's kind of like, it was kind of like a recliner, I guess, like you're sitting back. And he tells his next patient who had back issues to go ahead and lay face down on this table. And the patient didn't realize or didn't know that the table being left in that position was an accident. So he ended up laying face down but he was kind of like in this extended position. And Robin walks into the office a few minutes later, horrified to see that his patient is in this extended position because up until that time, extension wasn't really the most popular position. And all of a sudden, before say before apologizing, saying, oh my gosh, I put you in the wrong position, the patient gets off the table and says, wow, Dr. McKenzie or Robin, you fixed my back. And so these <laughs> McKenzie exercises were founded upon uh, an accident, but then being able to address and, and the entire McKenzie program is also based on the fact that it's what the body prefers in regards to what your body is telling you. If you bend forward and touch your toes, does it make you better, worse, or the same? And that in itself should actually dictate what you should be doing when it comes to pain mitigation. And yep. so that, that, that's a quick little side. But it's, uh, it's always just a very intriguing story that I love telling because it's not, it's not a common story that people hear and people. Yeah, just, I didn't, oh I didn't know that story. And, and <laughs> you brought up a great point saying it's what your body, it's, it's like, I'm not just going to give you the McKenzie or the extension exercises. If you do those and makes your symptoms worse, we're not going to do that. Uh, I'm not saying that's a position you should completely ultimately avoid forever. Maybe work into that because sometimes you may end up in that position. Who knows? However, um, it depends on what you need. Like it's not a one size fits all. That's why you need to get a therapist or medical provider that is knowledgeable and that can guide you in the right things. Cause sometimes the flexion stuff feels good and it helps you. I'm not saying you need to stay in a flex bent over a rounded position all the time, but sometimes getting into that position, working out of it and it can help. It can relieve some of your symptoms. It just really depends on the person because not all sciatica is the same, right? Quote unquote, I always like to say sciatica is such a, I don't know, like the term is just so interesting, right? It's just, it has so many, there's so much they could mean. For sure. And 
um, for the, in the previous episodes, I've talked about sciatica is really, it, sciatica itself, the diagnosis is really just saying that there's an irritation along the sciatic nerve distribution. Mm -hmm. um, and so it could be caused by multiple things. It could be caused by stenosis. It could be caused by a herniated disc. It could be caused by the fact that the piriformis is really tight. Um, like, and so, yep. yeah, it's possible. And so there, since there's so many causes, it's actually really important for us um, either as uh, patients who are experiencing this, or even even more so important for practitioners to be able to identify, okay, well, what are the biggest challenges? And in order for us to identify the biggest challenges, we have to address this issue one step at a time with the major priority. If you're in pain, the priority is to bring your pain down before we do anything else. It's kind of yep. like, uh, there's a saying where um, if you are a healthy person, you have a million dreams. You have a million things that you want to do, countless things. But when you are in pain and when you are sick, your first dream is to get unsick, get healthy again. And so sure. being able to say, this is what we need to do. So the big premise, and it looks like we really share the same view, is the fact that if you're in pain, especially when it comes to sciatica, is identifying what makes it feel better um, and being able to, in a way, use that simplicity. But I want to clarify uh, with the listeners that simplicity does not necessarily mean a lack of effectiveness. In fact, the more simple you get, the more effective you become. Over the past 10 years, I went from graduating school thinking I can fix everyone only a year in realizing I can't fix anybody. So then I took a whole bunch of courses and I was like, great, I have all these tools to being overwhelmed with all the tools that I had. And over the past, we'll say four to five years, I realized, wow, I don't necessarily, it's good to have all the tools in my back pocket, but if I can simplify the way that I see the human body, I can actually get really fantastic results with the people without overwhelming me, without overwhelming the patients. And yeah. so with that being the case, let's talk about the, so we have trauma, um, we have overuse. Now, oftentimes overuse could be a result of the body's inability to meet the necessary demands and meet the stresses. And oftentimes I find those overuse injuries or the, yeah, those overuse injuries as a product of not being recovered enough, doing too much work and not letting the tissues, not letting the nervous system recover from bout after bout. So if, um, with your experience as a jujitsu practitioner for 14 years, about 14 years, 2008, right? Is that what you yep. said? 14 mm -hmm. years. Um, what are some of your go-to recovery strategies um, in while well, as a, a training in BJJ? Uh, so, man, there's a lot. I mean, recovery doesn't have to be complicated. It could be as simple as, hey, get enough sleep, eat the right foods, right? get get uh and don't just go sit on your butt like go for if if you're having a recovery day it could be a nice walk get outside ride a you know ride a bike something kind of low load nothing that you're strenuous um but recovery can be as simple as um diet it can be as simple as sleep making sure your water intake is is adequate um it could be you know some people like to do yoga a light yoga light flow um I will sometimes just work on some kind of easy stretching and things like that. Um, nothing really aggressive, but just more like, you know, meditation, breathing. Like, I mean, so many people do not know how to breathe properly. They don't, they, they're chest breathers, you know, they use those upper traps. And as jujitsu practitioners, we're always using our traps to fight off chokes and defend. And, you know, so it's like just working on breathing, getting in a relaxed state. Um, I, I do a lot of like, you know, I like doing like a daily, uh, cars or a joint mobility routine, which is really good for keeping those joints, keep in the fluid in the joints, um, just keeping the fluid healthy and getting movement. Movement really helps with recovery, like getting some movement, getting that blood flow is so vital. Um, you know, out, outside of, and then like part of recovery is, is training frequency and training intensity. Those two are coupled together. Um, how many times a week you train and how hard you train 
you have to play with those numbers. And as we get older, uh, recovery takes a little bit more time. So you got to be more dialed in into what you're doing and how hard you're training and understand that maybe one day you're going to go to the gym and you're going to, you're going to drill, but you maybe take it, take it easy on the rolling that day or the, the, or the sparring. Um, let me know if you need clarification on any jujitsu terms. Uh, you know, I don't know how many people, uh, but our podcast is pretty much jujitsu related, you know? And so like everybody usually is familiar with the terms, but like just sparring, like grappling together. Um, but yeah, like, I think it, you have to be your own advocate in a lot of ways, uh, on your recovery and you got to figure out what works for you. Um, you know, I, I, there's certain things I like to do that some people, some things don't help people. Like I'll do CBD and CBD is one of those things where it's very specific to the individual, but I've been taking CBD for a while. And I feel like it helps me helps my recovery, helps my sleep a little bit. It's something that I use, but some people don't get benefit from it, right? It's not a one size fits all. And I think you just have to figure out what kind of supplements or, or what kind of techniques are helpful. But I think that sleep is an easy one. Um, making sure you adequately, you know, are, are drinking enough water um, and just get some movement, gentle, comfortable movement that can help you. And I think those are, those are really crucial. Amen to that, man. Yeah. <clears throat> I love the fact that you talked about being your own advocate. Um, no one knows what you need more than what your body is telling you. Yep. And I've been saying this a lot recently because it becomes even more apparent. The One of the many things that separates from us humans from animals is the fact that our higher processing centers of our brain, the gray matter of our brain, can actually really override the signals that our brainstem and our other primitive reflexes, we can really override them. Because if you look at a dog, right, you're walking a dog and the weather's really hot, they're going to take maybe 50 steps. And then once it's too hot, they're going to just sit and say, I don't want to walk anymore. And the reality is the fact that it's not that this dog is stubborn. It's the fact that the way that the dog's brain is wired is that once something happens like that, they're not going to push through because it's a survival mechanism. For us humans, we can really override that. And it happens all the time. How many of you who are listening get like four to five hours of sleep? You wake up, you're exhausted, only to realize, oh my gosh, my phone is blowing up. I have 900 emails and I have to go to another meeting. Your deeper brain centers are going to say, no, I need more sleep but your higher operating centers are going to say, no, I have to address these problems. And so it's a good thing for us humans because it allowed us to push human performance and also allowed us to push for innovation, but also it kind of acted upon our detriment because that's when we're chronically tired. And when you're chronically tired and you don't have enough recovery, you can then be a little bit more prone to experiencing these overuse injuries. And so mm -hmm. being your biggest advocate is huge and listening to your body and not overlooking those signals in which your body's presenting to you. And I also love the fact that you talked about the concept of training frequency and training intensity. I swam in college um, at Villanova University. I was a distance freestyle specialist. We had 10 training sessions a week, it meant that we did double training sessions, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then we had a single session on Wednesdays and a single session on Saturdays. And then Sundays was a full blown rest day. And I remember retiring from swimming and said, okay, I still need to work out six days a week. Now, as I was leading towards a way, uh, leaning, I guess, aging away from my early twenties, I realized that I physically couldn't push myself as hard as I used to. And when I got involved with CrossFit, the typical competitive CrossFit routine is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, single session, and then Wait, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, rest Thursday, single session Friday, single session Saturday. And I said, oh my gosh, I have two days off of not working out. My body feels amazing. Mm -hmm. And then now as I'm in my 30s, I want to go to jujitsu as much as I, as I can. As you said, it's very consuming, but being able to do it six days a week for me is a little bit hard on my body and I can feel it. So then I can realize, okay, now I don't necessarily, or it's either I go in and I don't train as intensely, or I focus on taking the day off and incorporate it, the active recovery, the stretching, the form rolling, the moving around to just let yep. my body feel good. Yeah. And I think the, the, you have to realize what your goals are, you know, you being a little older, you're, you're probably gonna be a world champion in jujitsu. Those guys are, and women are in their early twenties. 
and they push it. Like you said, when you were a competitive swimmer, you swam pretty much, you, you push your body to the edge, to the limit as close, you go as close to that little cliff without going over. Right. And these jujitsu athletes now it's changed so much in the time that even I've trained the past 10 years, like you got people starting at, you know, young kids, six, seven years old, five years old. And now they're becoming, you know, now they're like 18 and, and 17. They're starting to become uh, world champions. And these guys and, and, and women train so, so hard and they push it to the limit. And, and you have to do that. Unfortunately, I feel like that's, it, it's just the way it is. You have to push your body to that edge. Well, what happens is when they are going to be 30 years old, uh, 32, 35, their body's going to break down. It's just, and I've seen it happen over and over. A lot of these uh, world champions, their bodies start to break down because um, they try to squeeze everything, every ounce of uh, their body, you know, you know, every ounce that they have into their training. And I'm not saying it's wrong. And I'm not saying it's right. It's just whatever your goals are. And if your goals are to be a world champion, or like you said, a competitive swimmer that swimming at a high level, uh, you have to, pretty much sacrifice certain things um, and risk injury. And a lot of times the, those individuals are injured a lot more frequently and they kind of push through when somebody that's a recreational or a hobbyist in jujitsu is not going to, like, I'm not going to do that. You know, I've got kids in a, and, and a job and, and stuff like that. And I, I can't do that to my body. I can't try to break myself down. Then I won't have anything left. But if your jujitsu your goal is to be a jiu-jitsu champion and a, and a high, high level competitor. You have to push yourself to the limit. And I even hate saying that, but that's just what it requires. And it's tough. It, it, there are sacrifices there for sure. And uh, you, you you do sacrifice your health. We think of, you say jiu-jitsu is the gentle art. Well, it's, I mean, I think it's a unique sport, a unique martial art that you can do for a very long time in some capacity. But to be a very high level athlete, you have to push yourself to to close to the limit. And that's just the that's just the truth as as any sport that's becoming that's blowing up, it's becoming more popular. Um, training methodologies are going to evolve and change. Um, but it's just like I think that's just what has worked so far is pushing yourself that hard. And you know, that that's just that's that's one of the um one of the things I, I think that's unfortunate, but it is a necessity, I think, at this point. I think until people train their methodologies and or change their training methodologies and they find something that works better. Yeah. The the price we pay to be uh, elite level competitors is uh is is a pretty big price. Um, and so thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah, it's 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 a really eye-opening experience. I'm so glad that you were able to take the time out of your day to share your knowledge with everyone listening here today. Um, so we covered, uh, briefly covered treatment. We talked about recovery. Um, so this is like a really broad statement, but if we were to do like three major action steps for people, for people who are there, we'll just say jujitsu practitioners, like what, what are three really crucial, what are the three biggest actionable steps that uh, a person can take uh, training in BJJ to prevent their injuries from coming on? I think number one is listen to your body. That's very important. That's probably number I, I have actually like a, an ebook with like uh, top 10 injury prevention tips. I know that's up there. Uh, listen to your body. That's, that's gotta be number one. Um, what else? Let me see. I, I think uh, start slow. Um, Jiu-jitsu is very, it uh, can be addicting. And I, what I want you to, to, what I encourage is like, don't go one day and then all of a sudden you're going to go every day, twice a day. Number one, you're not going to let your body adapt. So you got to let that, that occur. And that's different for everybody. Some people are younger and better shape, healthier, they're more used to a rigorous training schedule. Um, if you're someone that's just getting into it and you're a hobbyist or older, you have to take your time, let your body adapt. And then, um, so I think that like the other point of that is that you kind of keep that hunger. A lot of people um, get really into jujitsu and then they kind of burn out because the infatuation, the initial like excitement of it fades away and it will. And you got to figure out, you got to realize what your why is. Why do you do jujitsu? And to build a habit, you know, um, I think the other one's consistency. I'll just kind of lead into it. I think be consistent, right? Show up even when you don't want to show up because after you're done, it's like, man, I'm tired today. I don't want to do this workout. 
get in the gym, do something. And so I think like, listen to your body, start slow, and then just be consistent, show up. And then the other bonus is recover, get enough sleep, eat well. Um, but I think those are the key, the key ingredients there. And then like, that's not to say you start with two days a week and then you build up to three, four, five, whatever you want to do, whatever feels good for your body. And then, um, do your mobility work too. We can be here all day, uh, do your mobility work, do, do whatever feels good to you. Um, think of if you're it really into jujitsu, think of the things that you do outside of jujitsu as a direct uh, or it's really an indirect correlation, but it will help your jujitsu, whether it's strength training, very important for, for injury mitigation. I think you should strength train uh, at least a couple days a week um, that those are all going to be key factors. But I, I think definitely, you know, um, if you start slow, you're going to keep that hunger and be like, Oh man, I'm thinking about jujitsu. I want to go back, but don't bring it up slow. And that way you'll continue to keep that hunger. And then hopefully you'll be able to stick with it. You'll build a consistency and a habit. And I think it'll help you um, stick with jujitsu for long haul. You know, for me now, I'm not really motivated or unmotivated with jujitsu. I just show up. It's part of my routine. And so you have to integrate it uh, in that way. Beautiful. So I love the fact that I think when people think, okay, let me take these action steps. Let me see if there's like a magic pill that I could take to make sure that either it's like a magic pill for my jujitsu to be awesome or a magic pill to make my pain go away. And even over over these six pieces, it's a lot of very simple actionable steps that will truly make a huge impact, but you have to put the work into it to be able to allow yourself to reap the benefits um, as compared to something that's going to be happening overnight. And I'm very appreciative that you are sharing that. Um, Eugene, Again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your knowledge with our listeners. Um, There's probably a good amount of people who are listening to today's podcast and wants to get in touch with you, work with you. So if someone wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? How can they find you? Um, So there's a couple different ways. I actually uh, started my YouTube channel. It's been probably five, six years ago. And the the whole idea uh, was just to give people information and knowledge uh, as I learned it along the way, working with my training partners and giving them uh, uh, concepts and and ideas and just things they could use to improve uh, their jujitsu or keep them healthy on the mats. That was the whole goal behind this thing was uh, my coach uh, Chewy was like, because people keep hitting me up like, Hey man, how do I do this? And he's like, dude, you should charge for your time. You should help like, but charge for your time. It's worth it. You've you're educated. You know, you have this experience, you spent all this time and effort. And as just a message to any other physical therapists, whatever you charge, you're worth that. So charge what you feel like you're worth, you know, for, for working with people, don't give your stuff. Don't give your information that the stressful nights of studying and the, you know, and the hard work you've put in, that's not something you should give away for free. I think some information is great. Like I, I have my YouTube videos, like uh, they're free, obviously, but like there's stuff that I think if somebody really wants your time, you should, you should charge for your time. That's just a, and I didn't feel that. That's why I'm sharing that. Cause as a new grad or even someone that's been training or doing, doing physical therapy for a long time, I didn't feel like I was like, I can't charge for, you know, but you can and you should, because people will value it as well. Um, but to get in contact with me, you can get on, uh, I have a, a website, the jujitsu therapist.com. And then I have some injury prevention products on there, uh, some courses and instructionals on mobility on warm up. I have a pretty beefy hip course, which has been like uses a lot of these principles of end range strengthening and mobility work. I think it's, it's, uh, I made that one during the pandemic, actually, just because uh, I think it was, I had some time on my hands. Um, you can send me an email through there or, uh, you know, at uh, the jujitsu therapist.com. Uh, my, my email is jujitsu therapist at gmail.com. And then my YouTube channel is the jujitsu therapist. Instagram is the underscore jujitsu underscore therapist. So a bunch of places. I usually check everything. So um, if you have questions uh, about, jujitsu or kind of just physical therapy stuff, let me know. I'll be happy to help you you guys out. Great. Uh, Listeners, Eugene's information is also going to be found in today's show notes. So if you didn't catch that, you can go ahead and copy and paste it from the show notes. Eugene, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you got some help from today's podcast. 
And for more info, check us out at ifixyoursciatica.com. Have a fantastic and pain-free day. No patient-therapist relationship is formed by listening to this podcast. We are not providing medical advice and all information should be confirmed by a medical provider.